How's it going everyone? It's Sam. We are going to take a look at how to retire early from rental properties. Now this is something that I'm really fascinated by. I know that a lot of people don't really talk about it on YouTube because it doesn't do well, right? People don't really care that much because they don't have the down payments a lot of the time to be able to do what we're talking about here today. But I want to give you an example. So if you're thinking about doing this in the future, you know how powerful this can be. You know the four different wealth drivers that happen in real estate and how you can make a lot of money and get a lot of cash flow in real estate. Because even if you are not able to do this now, maybe a couple years down the line after some good returns in the stock market or a couple of raises, you might be able to do this. This is going to be very powerful, like I said. Now, if you guys don't mind, just hitting the like button. Again, not many people watch these kinds of videos. Also, if you guys want to help out, if you guys want some free money, there is a link down there to SoFi Money where both of us can get $25 if you start using SoFi Money. So I'll put that down there just in case. Uh, again, these don't do that well, these videos, but I think it's going to be really helpful for anyone that is interested in this long term. So we're going to assume the property that you're buying is $150,000. Now, it could be higher. It could be lower. You know, it's going to depend on your area, but also you can invest in other states. There are ways to get around that if you live in California or New York or somewhere expensive. And a lot of the time you can find properties pretty close to where you are for less money. So we're going to assume the property cost is $150,000. Now, in this example, we're going to say you have the money for a 25% down payment. We're not going to say that you're house hacking, which is where you go and live in part of the property. If you do that, you can put as, as little money down as about 3 to 4%. So if you, if you are able to do that, if you don't have a significant other and you don't mind going and renting out half the property and you living in the other half or something like that, then you're going to have to put a down payment down. Otherwise, if you are willing to do that, you only have to put down, you know, a couple thousand dollars a lot of the time. So you come up with $37,500. Again, might take a while of saving, might take some of you guys to maybe cash out some stocks that you have or get some raises. Whatever you have to do, maybe you raise some money from like friends and family, you find a good deal and you realize, okay, I can, I can put $37,500 down. Okay, so for that mortgage, for the $112,500 mortgage at a 4% mortgage rate, that's going to be about $537 a month. So from there, we're going to say that you found a property that needs a little bit of fixing up. It doesn't need a ton of work, but you need to put $20,000 in. Maybe it's that it needs some uh, a new heater, or maybe it needs the, the floors redone, or the kitchen redone, bathrooms, something most likely cosmetic that can add some value and will really make the property look a lot better. So that way, now you actually have the value of 190000 Now, that's very possible. A lot of people can put in about uh, 10000 and get $20,000 worth of value, or 20,000 and 40,000, you're putting in a good amount of time and effort and money. So a lot of the time you can build a little bit of forced appreciation there. So the new value of the home is $190,000. So all in, you actually put in about 57,500. Again, this isn't for everyone. Maybe this is a couple years down the line, but I think most people can do this. If you're watching this video, you're already on the right track because you're watching a video about finance in your free time. So from there, we're going to use the 1% rule. We're going to say you can rent this out for 1% of the home's value every month. Now, some areas don't allow you to do this. Some are much higher. Some are much lower. I know where I am right now in this city. It's hard to get the 1% rule. It's hard to find something that's $200,000 that can rent for $2,000. But if I go 40 minutes north, we have the 2% rule there. We have over 2% on some properties. You can buy it for $30,000. And you can rent it out for seven or eight hundred dollars a month. So we're gonna say nineteen hundred dollars a month in rent. Again, for some people that's a lot. For some people that's not very much. We're gonna say this is a duplex too. So one half of the property is renting for nine hundred and fifty dollars. So that maybe makes a little bit more sense for why it might be around nineteen hundred. So you bought a duplex for one hundred and fifty grand, and now each side's renting for just under a thousand. Then expenses, we're going to use the the 50% rule, which is that half the rent goes to expenses. Now, this can be CapEx, vacancy, property taxes. This is just, this is a, 
pretty safe way of estimating expenses. Now, I really would suggest breaking it down when you're actually looking at the property, but we're gonna say that about half the rent goes to expenses. So what we're left with is $1,900 minus 950 minus the 537 for the mortgage, and we have about $413 a month in cash flow, which gives us a cash on cash return of just under 9%. So this is not like a home run play, but this is not bad at all, 8.6%. And in addition to that, we don't just have cash flow. Cash flow would be about $5,000, 4,956 to be exact. We have forced appreciation where we put in $20,000 worth of rehab, and now it's actually worth $20,000 more on top of that. So we have some equity right away, which is awesome. But also we get property pay down. So the first year they are paying our mortgage for us and our loan actually went down about $2,000, which is awesome. Also over the length of the loan, it's actually going to increase the amount that is actually paid down because as we get further and further down in the loan, there is less and less loan. So then there's less interest. So that means that we're actually paying off more mortgage and less interest as time goes on. So the average is actually about $3,750 throughout the 30 years that we're going to be paying down every single year. But then we have tax benefits. Now, this is something that's going to be different for everyone. I put this as 5,455. This is the fact that you can actually depreciate your rental properties over time, over about 27 and a half years for a lot of these properties, you can depreciate them, which would give us probably a tax write off, of course, talk to your professional about this of about $5,500. Now, depending on what tax bracket you're in, this might give you like $2,000 back on your taxes. This might be $100 back on your taxes if you don't make a lot of money. So it's going to depend on your own situation. I put it in here. Now, I'm not going to put this into some more of our calculations, but it does show you that there are some tax benefits and then appreciation. So we're going to say the $190,000 value appreciated 2% just 2%, which is $3,800. Now the bank doesn't get any of this. We get all of that appreciation. Our loan is actually paid down $2,000. Our appreciation went up about $4,000. We got $5,000 worth of cash flow. We built $20,000 of extra equity. So our total return, which is not including tax benefits, it's not accounting for forced appreciation, is almost $11,000, which is an ROI of about 18.7%. Now, when you include the fact that we actually built a lot of uh, a lot of extra equity in the property, that's awesome. That pushes it up even higher. Now, looking at how you can use this over time to build even more equity, we're going to take a look here. Of course, the first property is great. Five thousand dollars a month or five thousand dollars a year is fantastic, but that's not going to get you to be able to retire. So, what are we going to do? Well, we're we are going to have to start building up our portfolio properties. In year one, we have a cash for one property, just like we did above. We're gonna buy that one property, do all the fixing up, and then actually we're gonna refi it. So in this first year, we're actually gonna refi it. Just pay attention to this top line here. And we're gonna get about $33,000 out. Now, how are we doing this? Well, our property is worth 193,800 after the first year, because remember, we built it up to $190,000 property and then it appreciated a little bit. And then we're gonna get 75% of that out. Now we do have to pay off our old loan so you can do this cash out refinance. But after that's all done, you're actually gonna have about $33,000 worth of equity that you can take out of the property. Now of course there's gonna be some closing costs, a couple thousand dollars or something, but I'm not gonna account for that here because it's gonna be pretty small in the grand scheme of things. And then we have the cash flow of about $5,000. So yes, we spent $57,500, but then we got this amount out. So we got both of these together out. Now we're gonna assume that this first year or the second year, you're gonna be able to put in another $5,000. I mean, you put in almost 60,000 the first year, we're gonna say you put in another $5,000 just for the first couple of years here, and then we're not gonna need it anymore, but $5,000 you're gonna sit tight on this one property. You're gonna you're gonna keep on giving the cash flow. Now this year we're gonna say you raise rents about two percent. Now this would give you or your cash flow would go up about two percent. So you're going to have to charge a little bit more for rent every single year. We're just gonna assume your cash flow goes up. Now if you increase your rent, your mortgage isn't gonna increase. 
but your expenses might a little bit. So we're just gonna assume a, a nice little 2% bump. Like I said, not anything huge, but it is accounting for some inflation. Then the third year comes around, you're still sitting tight, you have almost enough to do another property, you really need $57,500, but you don't have it. So you're sitting tight, still on one property, getting another 2% in cash flow this year, so three years in, you have one property. And then the fourth year comes around where you actually have enough money to invest and buy another property. So this year, you're putting in $5,000, but after this, you're not gonna have to do that again. So you're putting in $5,000 on top of your cash flow, you buy a second property and you're gonna refinance it. You're gonna do the exact same thing that you did before. You bought it at 150, you put in another 20 grand. So you put in the 37,500, you put in another 20 grand, you build it up to $190,000 property, you refinance it at the end of the year and you're able to get, again, the same amount that we got out last time, about 33,000. Now, you actually have about $10,000 in cash flow. So we're gonna increase the rents from that last property about 2%. And then you have this new cash flow of about $5,000. Fantastic. Now you have two properties. You're getting $10,000 a year in cash flow. And we're still increasing this about 2% a year. So now you have the leftover from the $63,000. So about $5,000. Then you have the $33,000 that you just refinance. And then another $10,000 worth of cash flow. So now you have to sit tight again. One more year, you have to sit tight. Sit on two properties. Actually four doors because you have... Again, you have two duplexes, you're sitting tight, you get another $10,000 in cash flow, and then you have enough for a third property. And this is where it starts to get interesting. You buy another one, you refinance it, now you have $15,000 in cash flow. So pretty significant right there, almost $1,500 a month. This year you have to sit tight one last time and then you can start buying properties every single year. So by year eight, you have four properties, eight doors, you buy another property, you refinance it, you're making almost $2,000 a month, you get your 33,000 back, you're able to buy another property. And this is the money that we have left over after buying the last property. So now we're at five, you buy five properties, you're getting 26,000, and then you just go a couple years, six, seven, eight, nine properties, and then all of a sudden, you have enough to buy two properties. So you buy two properties in this year, you refinance both of them, you make $66,000. You have $60,000 a year in cash flow. Now at this point, you could probably retire in about 14 years. You have, heck, you have 22 doors, 11 properties. You're making a lot in cash flow. You have 125 grand in cash because now you're buying multiple properties, you're refinancing multiple properties but you decide to go a little bit further. So you're able to buy two more doors a year, keep on refinancing, getting $60,000 out. Now, don't forget, you're still getting a loan pay down, you're still getting forced appreciation, you're getting uh, other appreciation just from the general market. So you're building a lot of equity. But then something interesting happens. You have 160 grand. You can buy three properties now. So you buy three properties this year, and you're able to actually refinance them, you get almost 100 grand out because again, you're taking your new properties, cash out refinancing them, you have 100 grand in cash flow. Then you do three again, three again, three again, and it starts to get the snowball effect, right? Where at first we had to wait three years to get another property. Now you can buy three properties every single year, six doors a year. This is not even accounting for the fact that, hey, you could refinance old properties from 20 years ago that probably have a significant amount of their loan paid down, and you could continue to increase this even more. If you want to refinance those older properties, again, you could get even more equity out. You could use HELOCs to get home equity out. So by the end, the last year, in 20 years, you actually have about 338 grand just sitting in the account waiting, and this is after all expenses, this is just increasing your cash flow 2% a year from the old properties. You have 54 doors now, so 27 properties, 54 doors. Your cash flow is about 151,000 a year. And this is again, not increasing as much as we could. The equity in properties, uh, in property 27, so the, the property that you have the least equity in, the last property, is still about 47,500. So that's a significant amount of equity. I mean, 
that means that every single property has at least 50,000 in it. But again, some of those first properties, you have over half the loan paid off and they've appreciated for 20 years in a row. So a lot of them, some of the beginning ones might be worth 300 grand and you only have 100 grand left. So you have a ton of properties with a ton of equity, millions of dollars in equity. And then once you start paying off the mortgages, that's where it gets crazy. I mean, at this point, you have another 10 years to pay off this mortgage. So you could be at year 30, you pay off that mortgage. And when you start looking at, okay, if we raise, uh, if we get an extra 2% cash flow every year for 30 years, now maybe you want to do this in chunks every couple of years, but you raise and you raise your cash flow 2% a year. You started with $5,000. Now you don't have to pay off the mortgage. Sure, there's some more expenses that add up, right? Everything costs a little bit more 20, 30 years down the line, but you're able to increase this. You don't have to pay the mortgage anymore. You would be getting almost $20,000 in cash flow per home. So that is really crazy. Again, uh, we're making some assumptions here, but you start paying off the properties one every single year and adding what ten thousand dollars per property in cash flow. You start bumping this up, and by the end, after you pay off all your homes, you're going to be raking in the dough hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash flow. Now, at the end, you might be around five hundred thousand to a million dollars worth of cash flow when you have no property, uh, no no mortgages to pay on your properties. You have four you have 54 doors and this is years into the future when there's inflation you have been raising rents so it is kind of crazy once you start looking at it you would have you would have millions and millions and millions close to 10 million dollars worth of equity too i mean at the end of each of these properties 30 years if we just look here you can see that if we multiply this out each property would be worth about three hundred forty-five thousand dollars about 30 years after we actually bought it and increased the property value to 190,000. Now, all of these are going to hit their 30 year mark at different times because we're buying them at different times. And of course, we might not be able to get the same property at 190,000 that we did in year one as year 20 because homes are going to change value. But if we look at 27 properties that are worth that much, we're talking about over $9 million worth of equity. So at this point, you might be saying to yourself, okay, but how do I get the money for the down payment? Because I don't have $57,000 sitting around. Well, the interesting thing is you only need the initial down payment once, and then you need a couple thousand dollars after that, right? We talked about $5,000 for three years in a row. So the total money invested is only about $73,000. Now, that's a lot for a lot of people, right? But when you look at that compared to what you would invest in stocks over your lifetime before you retire, it's much lower. And when you look at the return that you get from this, the return is insane compared to the stock market. So in the year 20, we have cash flow of about $150,000. Now, you might be saying, okay, how does that stack up compared to stocks, right? Because cash flow is different than stocks. But if you use the 4% rule, right, that's a rule that a lot of people use to retire, which is that to get $150,000 in cash flow or in uh, money out every single year, you need 25x that. Or you can take your portfolio and multiply it by 4% and that's the amount that you get out. So if you have a million dollars in stocks, you can get $40,000 worth out every single year and that's a safe withdrawal rate. So if you start looking at this and you say, okay, equivalent uh, I, I think I spelled that right. Equivalent for, to the 4% rule, you need a portfolio of $3.7 million worth in stocks. Now, this is not even accounting for all the equity we have, right? I mean, if we want to, we could start drawing on the equity. This is just accounting for cash flow. So I would, I would guess this would be actually much higher if we used all the equity we had in the properties. Uh, when you start thinking about how much money we actually have in the properties, it's it's kind of crazy. But you just look at the cash flow. That's the equivalent of $3.76 million. So if you started with $73,000 and you wanted $3.76 million 20 years later, you would need a 22% rate every single year. So you would need to over double the stock market indexes. You would have to be investing as well as Warren Buffett in his heyday as some of the best investors of all time for 20 years in a row. So you would need to have insane returns. This is again, not even accounting for all the equity we built up. 
there's no way that you can do that. <laughs> there's no way that the majority of people can do that. But people have done that year in and year out in real estate because in the world of stocks, right, everyone has access to the same information. There is no hidden gem. I mean, sure, sometimes you do get in on those a little bit early and you can make great returns. But the thing is, that is very hard to do year in and year out. That's very difficult to do for the majority of people compared to real estate where everything is segmented. There's a high barrier of entry. Sometimes you have irrational sellers that are willing to sell because they just can't do something. They can't pay property taxes. They, they need to leave quickly. So they are willing to sell at a discount. Some people just don't care, right? There are all kinds of things that come up in real estate and maybe you just have an eye for something that other people don't. So you can build a great portfolio, have great returns in real estate, and you can outperform the majority of people in the stock market in real estate. Now, sure, it might be a little bit of extra work, but when you start looking at these cash flows, it's crazy. I hope you guys like that. Uh, I know that I am planning to do something hopefully somewhat similar, maybe maybe a little bit faster at first uh, than waiting three years to buy a second property, but we'll see. Thank you guys so much. If you guys want to check out that link down below to SoFi Money, again, you can get $25 for free and it gives me $25. So thank you guys for doing that. And I will see you in the next video. Bye.